All right, welcome back everybody to the Tomcat track. Mark Thomas is going to be talking to us about debugging complex issues in web applications. And uh, I believe this may be its maiden voyage at a, at a uh, conference. So uh, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Chris. OK, so start off with a quick introduction. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Thomas. I've been a Tomcat committer since 2003. And my day job is at VMware, where I've been in various forms since 2008. And there I have a very simple job description, which is go and do whatever you think is best for Apache Tomcat. Um, so I get to spend the majority of my time working at the ASF on Tomcat. But I also spend some time over at Eclipse working on the Jakarta EE specifications that Tomcat implements. And I also spend a little bit of time on VMware related stuff, mainly providing support to customers that use Tomcat or use VMware TC server, which is our uh, server built on top of Tomcat. In terms of an agenda for today, uh, I want to look at what I mean by a complex issue. I'll then talk a little bit about how I approach them. We will touch very briefly on statistics, but not very long because I'm not a mathematician. And we'll spend the bulk of the presentation looking at a couple of use cases and the techniques I used to get to the bottom of them. There are a few techniques I sometimes use that aren't covered in those use cases. So I will cover those um, at the end. And I'll take questions at the end. I'm afraid I can't see the chat window at the same time as I'm presenting. So if you do have any questions, they are going to have to wait to the end, I'm afraid. So, right, let's start off with what I mean by a complex issue then. This is entirely subjective. Um, my idea of a complex issue might not be the same as yours. But for me, they sort of fall into three categories. Now, these categories are all interrelated and they're not truly independent. But what I tend to find is that in any particular issue, one category dominates compared to the others. So I tend to think of them as three separate categories, although in reality, there are obvious interrelations between them. So things that, things that might make it a complex issue. First of all, if it's not 100% repeatable, then that puts it in the complex issue category for me. Because generally, the harder something is to repeat, the harder it's going to be to debug. And that's because whatever approach you use to debugging, fundamentally, it's going to be recreate the issue, collect some data, analyze the data, make some changes, repeat. And the harder it is to repeat, the, hard, the longer it's going to take you to do that recreate the issue bit, and then that drags the process out. Um, issues that occur under load, uh, the complexities there are generally around just the volume of data you have to deal with, the amount of debug logging, the amount of access logs, the amount of network traces, just the sheer volume of data you have to dig through if you're you know, processing tens of thousands of requests a second and the issue only happens twice a day. There's an awful lot of data there that isn't going to be relevant that you need to filter out to get to the little bit that is. So that adds a degree of complexity. And the third category for me is concurrency. And that's really any issue where it becomes obvious that whatever's going on, it's something to do with interactions between multiple threads. And what creates the complexity there is as soon as you change anything on the system, the chances are you're going to change the interaction between those threads, which means almost certainly you'll make the problem harder to reproduce. Sometimes you'll get really lucky and you actually make it easier to reproduce. But 99 times out of 100, any change you make makes it harder to reproduce, which obviously makes your life that little bit more complicated. In terms of methodology, I mean, fundamentally, the issue you're tackling needs to be sufficiently repeatable that this process or whatever process you choose to follow is viable. Now, for a, an application-specific issue in your environment, it might be that actually you know there's a problem, but you've found a workaround. It's a good workaround. It's stable. It doesn't cause any other problems. And actually, going with the workaround is what makes most business sense for you. That's fine. For Tomcat, that's a slightly different equation. Um, and we haven't yet got an issue where we said, no, we can't fix this. We don't know what the problem is. We're just going to leave it. What we might say is that, OK, we haven't got enough data yet, or we can't reproduce this yet. So we'll just put it on the back burner and wait for some more data to come in. And experience tells us that it does. Um, we have had issues that have been in that state for quite long periods of time. We don't have any at the moment. 
certainly not ones that have been in that state for a particularly long time. I think the longest is probably a couple of months just waiting for additional data from users. So nothing like the longest we've ever had. So for us, we all the aim is always to try and fix the issue. We're not interested in workarounds. We want to get to the root cause. So for the methodology itself, then where I start is I want to work out at a high level, where's the issue occurring? Um, sometimes I'll have a stack trace for an exception and I'll have a pretty good idea of, okay, it's somewhere around here. At least that bit of code is where I need to start looking. Sometimes I've got no more clue than, well, something's going wrong somewhere in the request processing, but I haven't got a clue what or where. So sometimes you're starting off with quite a broad area to search. Sometimes it's quite narrow. But however big that area is, the approach I take is always the same. And that record the state before, record the state afterwards, and then check that the two states are consistent with what I would expect to happen between those two points. And when things are going wrong, then something will be inconsistent. Exactly what will be depend on the um, case in hand. I'm, if I knew something with HTTP2, for example, it might be that, oh, a flow control window has gone negative. Well, that shouldn't happen. Um, so where's it gone negative? And that's what I'm trying to find out. So I know that it happens somewhere be between the before and after states, and then it's just a case of narrowing the focus down. And typically, you're moving down the stack as you do that. Sometimes, if I've got a particularly large area to search, then I won't just do a binary search with a before and after. What I'll do is put multiple, record multiple states throughout a method or a class, and then look at it, okay, it's fine from point A to B, fine from B to C, ah, oh, it goes wrong between C and D, right, that's where I need to dig in. And with all of this, when I'm testing things, what I'm looking for is an, essentially a binary output that tells me either it worked or it didn't. Now, that might be a single request worked or a single request failed. It might also be a load test for 10 minutes didn't report any errors or a load test for 10 minutes did report any errors. All I'm really interested in is that pass fail result. And that brings us nicely on to statistics. Um, I must stress at this point, I am definitely an engineer, not a mathematician. So this is very much coming from the engineering estimate, good enough point of view. Um, if you want to look at the detail of the maths behind this, then there's lots and lots of stuff on the internet and uh, please feel free to um, dig into it to your heart's content. But from my point of view, what I'm, the sort of question I'm trying to answer is, let's say I run a test five times and I get two failures. I think I fixed the problem, I make a change, I think I fixed it, and I run the test five times again and I don't get any failures. Does that mean I've fixed the problem or am I just seeing statistical variation? And the answer is with those numbers, I don't know. And it's certainly been the case that far too often um, I'll think, oh, great, brilliant, fixed it, move on to the next thing. Only to later find out, actually, no, I haven't fixed it and I need to go back. And because you do often find yourself going back, it's really important to keep notes. Generally, what I try and do is keep a note of what I changed, what I used to do the test and what the results were. So if I'm using a load tester, I'll be recording things like how long it ran for, how many threads I used, um, which URLs I was requesting, that sort of stuff. So if I do need to go back and do additional tests, then it's easy to do because I've got all of the notes in front of me. So on to how do you tell whether it's statistical variation or whether you have actually fixed it? Essentially, you need more samples than you think. And a rough rule of thumb, yeah, engineering estimate and all that, is you need at least 20 tests. Um, excuse me a moment. Yes. When you plug your laptop into the power supply, it's always a good idea to switch the socket on. Right, where were we? Yes, samples. So to be sure of your data, you need at least 20 tests, you need at least five of them to pass, and you need at least five of them to fail. If you don't meet any one of those three criteria, you need to do more tests. And you keep going until you can meet all three. Now, obviously, there's an edge case there, which is when you have genuinely fixed the issue, you're never going to see any failures. So you do need to bear that in mind. And personally, if I was running, if I ran 20 tests and I got five failures, I ran another, I thought I fixed it, ran 20 tests, didn't get any failures, I'd be reasonably confident. I'd probably run another 20 just to be sure or something. But those kind of, you, you, you make a judgment. Um, do keep in mind when you're doing this, sometimes, not very often, but sometimes there will be more than one problem and you'll need to make more than one fix. So again, having more tests so you've got a better idea of how many failures you're having 
it's then a lot easier to see you to see that oh, I run 20 tests, I get 12 failures on average. I fix something, I run another 20 tests. Okay, I'm only getting three failures on average. Okay, I fixed something, or maybe I've partially fixed it, or maybe I've done anything quite right. Um, maybe there's multiple root causes, but with doing a high number of tests, then you can actually track that sort of thing. So with that, let's get on to some use cases. And the first one concerned large concurrent HTTP2 responses. And this one started on the users list uh, in June this year. Uh, there's the date, the um, mail thread subject, and the archive reference if you want to look it up. And it was a really nice example of a well-written bug report. And the essence of it was they had multiple HTTP2 streams all on the same connection, and these streams were blocked indefinitely. And in order to trigger this, the streams needed to be writing large files, and by large, they mean multiple gigabytes, and there needed to be three or more of them on this one connection. Um, now, that was, that was actually enough information for us to go away and recreate it, but the people reporting it had gone further and provided us some more additional really useful information. The first thing they told us was that they tested the same scenario with HTTP 1.1, and they couldn't recreate it. Now, that points reasonably strongly to the issue being with HTTP 2, but it might not be. It could be that there's just something in the timing of the way HTTP 2 works that trips over an issue in the low-level I.O. code, and that's where the blocking is happening. Probably HTTP 2, but might not, might not be, so we'll just keep that in mind. Um, they also said they tried repeating it with servlet non-blocking I.O. and servlet blocking I.O. That didn't make any difference. That's really useful information. Writing web applications that work properly with non-blocking I.O. is a lot harder than the API makes it look. And it's even more difficult to debug. So if we can actually recreate the issue with blocking I.O., that makes everything a lot simpler. So that's great. That was really helpful to know. And the other thing they told us in terms of the codings, they tried using Tomcat's I.O. utils to do the file copying from the large files out to the output stream. That didn't make any difference. Um, what that told us was that their own custom code that was doing that probably wasn't at fault. They gave us all the relevant version numbers, and they gave us a test case with source code. You know, really couldn't ask for very much more, um, but they, still, there was more to come. And that was a piece of analysis that said the streams were all waiting for a semaphore. Now, our first concern was, hang on a minute, it's waiting for an infinitely. That's bad. What are your timeout settings? Oh, you set an infinite timeout. OK, well, that explains that then. And our other question was, well, you haven't told us how often it repeats or how easy it is to recreate the issue. They said, oh, it happens about 60% of the time. And when we asked them that question, we got the answer back in about 90 minutes, sorry, about 60 minutes, which is great. So then we set about, OK, where do we need to look for this? Um, let's set about recreating it. So we know that HTTP2 connections are multiplexed. So you have one single network connection, and you have multiple streams all using that connection, all trying to respond to different requests and write their responses. And the way HTTP2 works is streams are broadly, there are a few, few rules, but broadly, one stream writes a frame, and then another stream can write a frame. There are a few places where streams have to write frames sequentially, but that doesn't apply here, so we'll just ignore that for now. And to ensure that only one stream is writing a frame at a time, we have a semaphore. And it was that semaphore that things were blocking on. Okay, so it's looking quite like HTTP2 is the source of this problem. And um, knowing the source code as I do, I know that internally HTTP2 uses asynchronous writes with a completion handler. And if now that does mean there's quite a bit of internal machinery for, for doing writes. For example, if the write can't complete, the socket's added to the polar. The polar then gets notified when the socket buffers are free again, and then that starts starts up the write again. So there's quite a bit of state that needs to be maintained. So there's an operation state instance that maintains all of the state for writes, and that's stored in a write operation field. There's actually um, similar for reads as well. So what we really want, we've got an idea of what's going on. We really want to sort of narrow where we want to start looking. Well, we were able to recreate the issue within 90 minutes of it being reported, um, which is really fast. Um, that's a great indicator of just how good the original report was. 
And because we can recreate it, we could do some high level tests to quickly include and exclude various bits of functionality. And the first thing that Remy suggested was, well, why don't you just turn off async IO and go back to normal synchronous IO, see what that does. As soon as we did that, problem went away. That gave us two things. It A, gave the user a workaround, and they had that within about four hours of their original report. And B, it pointed pretty strongly to there being something wrong with the asynchronous IO. Um, the user did have a brief question that, well, they were using asynchronous IO because of its performance benefits. If they turn that off, are they going to see a performance impact? And the short answer is, well, no, you're not, because what you're actually using HTTP2 for, having multiple, multiple concurrent streams, all writing large responses at the same time, is horribly inefficient anyway. So yeah, any impact of turning off async IO is going to be in the noise. Don't worry about it. Um, and we were also able to confirm that, actually, if you switch to NI, NIO2, the problem goes away. So that gave them another opportunity for a workaround. So we've got quite a lot of information. We can really start now trying to narrow down on where this root cause might be. We could see that the, set, the threads were waiting for the semaphore, which means that at some point, a write didn't complete. Socket got sent to the polar, and the polar should have indicated that it was ready for write. OK, what's gone wrong here? Started with a simple code review. Let's look at that bit of code. Is there anything that jumps out knowing that something somewhere is going wrong as a possible root cause? And the thing that struck me, given that the polar was involved, is that there was this interest ops flag associated with the socket. And it records which events that the socket has been registered for with the polar. With the polar. And the thing is, it's non-volatile, but it was being accessed in a non-synchronized way by multiple threads for both read and write. Now, that's potentially a concurrency issue. However, depending on what other um, fields were being accessed, whether or not they were volatile, whether or not there was any synchronization, it might or might not actually be a problem the way that that field was accessed. Now, at this point, I had two choices. I could sit down with the source code and do a very detailed code path analysis and work out whether the interest ops flag was being accessed in a safe way or not. Or I could just make it volatile and see if that fixed it. Um, I went for making it volatile because that seemed like it would be a lot quicker. Um, and initially, the testing was positive. Um, ran a few tests, problems seemed to go away. I was really happy. I was just starting to write it up, and I was running another test in the background, and it failed again. I hadn't stuck to my sample sizes. As soon as I did a larger sample size, it was obvious that actually, no, it makes absolutely no difference whether that flag is volatile or non-volatile. So restore the code to its original state, and let's go and look somewhere else. Um, my next step was, well, if maybe something's going wrong with the socket and the polar, because that's quite complicated code. We've had issues in there in the past. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that something isn't quite right. So let's debug our way through that. The second I added debug logging to the polar, that changed the timing, and the issue got a whole lot harder to repeat. Now, the polar is incredibly timing sensitive. So to address this, I used a trick I've used quite a few times, which is to change my logging strategy. Rather than what well, I'm interested in, what's going on in a block of code, debug logging before, have the block of code, debug, debug logging after. The approach I took was, OK, let's just copy the state from before, let the code run, then debug log the state before and the state afterwards. And because copying the state to local variables is a lot, lot faster than generating a debug log, then that didn't affect the timing anywhere near as much. And certainly in terms of repeatability, it didn't affect it at all. So that enabled me to sort of debug my way through the polar. And after the best part of a day or so debug logging, I was able to conclude that actually the polar is working perfectly correctly. Can't find anything wrong with it at all, which is great. Um, from one point of view, you know, there aren't any bugs there that I can find. Fantastic. It's a tricky piece of code. Good to see it's doing what it's meant to be doing. Not so good from the point of view of I still haven't found out why we're seeing this particular error. So if the polar is working properly, then what's going on with the write notification? Because the polar should just go and release the semaphore. It's not that much code at all. What's going on there? So the next step was to effectively trace that notification. And as soon as I did that, what was going on became a lot clearer. When the polar went to go and signal that write was possible again, the operation state that should have been maintaining the state of the in-progress write was null. So the event wasn't processed, um, and hence the semaphore wasn't released, so everything stayed locked up. 
So now the question is, okay, why was that operation state null? Did a code review and quite quickly found a potential root cause. So having found what I thought was a root cause, okay, let's try and confirm it. So I confirmed it in a couple of ways. First of all, I applied the fix and did some local testing. That looked very positive. I explained what I thought the problem was on the mailing list and one of the other committees, I think it was Remy, checked it and said, yep, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so I was reasonably confident. So because I said, remember I said earlier that write and read were very, very similar. Well, the same problem existed in read as well, so we fixed it. Um, so we managed to fix that one before anybody even noticed it, which is always nice. So if you want to understand exactly what was going on, and the slides say you need the code in front of you, it's it's nice to have, but it's not essential. Um, everything that's going on that's important is in Soccer Wrapper Base. You can get it from GitHub, and it's in line 1364 and around 1044. But essentially, what is happening is this. Let's imagine we've got two threads, T1 and T2, that are both HTTP2 streams, and they're both trying to write to the connection at the same time. So they both reach the point where they want the semaphore at the same time. Let's say thread one wins, so it gets the right semaphore. Thread two basically has to sit there and wait. So thread one then creates its operation state to maintain the state for this write, puts that in the right operation field, does the async write. That's all good. It completes. So thread one's completion handler is called. The first thing thread one's completion handler does is it releases, releases the semaphore, at which point thread two says, "Wee! I can go ahead, I can do my write now, grabs the semaphore, creates its operation state, sets the right operation and starts writing. Meanwhile, thread one's completion handler continues and says, oh yeah, I just need to clear up my operation state because I've finished now, so it clears out the right operation field. And what it's just done is it hasn't nulled out its own state, it's nulled out threads two, thread two state, and that was essentially where things went wrong. At this point, thread two doesn't notice. For some reason, the async write doesn't complete, so the socket gets passed to the polar. That's fine. Some point in the future, the polar says, okay, able to write again now. It goes to notify the semaphore, finds the operational write is null, so it can't notify the semaphore. There's normal dispatch, which essentially means that the write's going to time out. And the fix was it was actually quite simple. It was swapping the operation, the clearing of the write operation field and the releasing of the semaphore. So now what happens? is first of all, thread one clears its write operation state, then it releases the semaphore. So when the next thread continues and writes its own state, thread one is not going to uh, overwrite it or clear it out. So that was use case one. Um, use case two um, was a little bit different as, you, as you'll see as we go through. And the short version for use case two was that the connection was being dropped before the uh, response was written. Again, this was on the user's mailing list. It was actually back in October last year, almost a year ago. Again, subject and archive reference if you want to look it up. Again, another very well-written bug report, although the actual problem description really was as simple as very occasionally Tomcat doesn't send a response. What made it a good bug report was all the additional information that came along with it in terms of things they tested, things they'd looked for, investigations they'd done that helped us, A, narrow down where we thought we needed to look, but also gave us a good idea of what additional questions we could ask to try and further narrow it down. So what did they tell us? They told us that the access log showed there was a response. There were no exceptions at all in the logs, and the Wireshark trace showed that there was a TCP fin from Tomcat once the response had been, well, sorry, once the request had been received. And that means it's the start of a clean socket close. So it looks like, doesn't look like things are going wrong. It looks like Tomcat's closing the socket down cleanly, but for whatever reason, the response isn't being written. As you'd expect, we got all the version information. So at this point, we then start asking questions and we're really trying to either eliminate features or identify possible failure modes. First question is, how big is the response? Oh, it's a kilobyte. Ooh, that's interesting. Because if it's a, only a kilobyte, there are all sorts of places in the network stack, both in Tomcat, in the JVM, and in the network itself, where a kilobyte response might get buffered. So if that's happening and then things time out, if the timing's not just at the wrong point, you could Tomcat might think it's written the response, but you actually end up with the client not seeing it. Maybe that's what's going on. How long does it normally take to generate a response, hoping the answer was going to be sort of seconds or minutes? About 60 milliseconds. So all of those lovely theories about stuff being buffered somewhere in the network stack, well, that just got thrown straight out of the window because if the 
typical response time is in milliseconds, then it's very unlikely it's going to be time out related. As soon as we looked at the Wireshark traces in more detail, we saw that the, um, the connection close process was starting about 100 microseconds after the request had been received. So that further confirmed that, yeah, it's definitely not some weird network timing thing. Okay. May, if Tomcat's closing the connection that quickly, maybe there's something wrong with the request. Um, normally, you'd expect Tomcat to send a 400 response. But if there's something particularly wrong with the request, then Tomcat will just close the connection. And essentially, if it can't be sure it's dealing with HTTP, HTTP it will just close it. So, OK, we've got the network trace from Wireshark. Let's have a look at the request. It was absolutely perfect. There wasn't anything wrong with it. Um, Contents length where it was present was fine. All the line endings were correct. Um, headers were correctly formed. There really wasn't anything wrong with it at all. So, OK, it's not that. Architecturally, we've got user agent talking to firewalls, talking to Nginx, talking to Tomcat and back. Um, that might have been worthy of more, more sort of exploration if the timeout theory had panned out, but it didn't. So we sort of park that information for to come back to later if it's useful. Um, we could see from the Wireshark trace that it was an HTTP 1.0 request. That's great. That means it's definitely not anything related to HTTP 2. But also, that's really strange because the HTTP 1.0 code in Tomcat has been there for well over 20 years. Um, it's pretty well tested, it's pretty robust, and it's very unusual to see a bug in that code. So what on earth is going on? You know, a bit curious. Um, worth mentioning that the network traces they provided, they've actually got Wireshark running at both the Tomcat and the Nginx size, side of that connection. What that meant was we could rule out anything like, okay, is there a firewall you haven't told us about between Nginx and Tomcat that might be dropping packets? That sort of thing can happen, particularly in um, reverse proxy situations. Um, because we had both traces, we confirmed that that wasn't the case. Both what was coming out of Tomcat was exactly what was being received by Nginx, so nothing strange going on there. So really nothing that points us towards the root cause at this point. We can see that the application has got unique request IDs, and that is useful to help us trace things between different logs. At this point, I asked the question, sort of, how do you feel about running some custom debug code to get some more logging? But, well, it's production, so we don't really want to, but I guess if we have to, we'll, we'll discuss it and we'll get back to it. Okay, not fair enough. So we'll park that and we might come back to it. Um, other questions? Oh, yeah. When did it start and what did you change at that point? Now, I must confess, once in my career have I asked that question and actually got an answer, which was, oh, yeah, we changed that configuration, and lo and behold, that was the cause of the problem. It's worth asking the question, but equally, it's unlikely to solve the problem for you. But you, know, you all want to ask it just to make sure. And the systems were really lightly loaded as well. There were only so about 60 requests a second, and you know, Tomcat will handle tens of thousands of requests a second. So, it didn't look like it was load related. At this point, one of the other users on the mailing list said, well, why don't you run S-Trace? It looks like an OS issue. Now, the person who reported the issue didn't see that suggestion. And to me, it's not, I'm not sure there's really much pointing towards an OS issue. I, I can't see what the problem is, but um, I'm more likely to blame Tomcat than the OS, to be perfectly honest. So let's go and have a look at that. In hindsight, as we'll see in a bit, if we'd used S-Trace now, we probably would have saved some time. But hindsight's a wonderful thing. We went with the information we had. So the first thing we tried was um, changing connectors. So we switched from BIO to NIO, because this was uh, Tomcat 7. My BIO is still available, or was still available, because it's now end of life. Um, that didn't make any difference. So that tells us whatever's going on, it's not in the endpoint specific code. So it's not in the low level connector code. It's also unlikely to be a JVM issue. The reason for that is that the uh, BIO and NIO code in the JVM are very, very different. So chances of using the same bug with both is slim, so it's probably not a JVM issue. The timings quite strongly suggest that the JSP is actually spending time generating the bytes for response and putting um, an additional attribute in the access log confirmed that. We could see it was happening with BIOs. So that told us it wasn't send files. That's another block of code to rule out. There's no compression, so it's not GZIP. That's more things we can ignore. There really wasn't any obvious explanation at this point. 
Um, so we did get to the point where, okay, we need to add some custom debug logging. Now is probably a good time to mention that throughout this issue, everything was done remotely. Um, at no point did I have access to the system. At no point was I able to recreate the issue. Everything was done on the mailing list apart from sending some um, of the debug logs to me directly because they've got commercially sensitive information in them. But everything else, it was all done entirely remotely on the mailing lists. So we kind of reached the point where, okay, we need to do the custom debug logging. And if you want to see the code we use for this, it's available on GitHub at that URL. And we did it in multiple stages. Debug logging version one was really just confirming some of the basics. Was the response being written or not by the app? Yes, it was. Okay. When was the software placement? Before the response was written. Interesting. And the correct objects were being used. What I mean by that is one of the possible causes of this sort of issue is when an application retains a reference to, say, the output stream of a previous request and uses it for the next one. Um, what I was able to do with the debug logging was to confirm that that wasn't happening in this case. The correct objects were all being used. As far as I could tell, the application was doing what it was meant to do. So, okay, that, that didn't get very far. So, okay, debug logging version two then. Um, put a little bit more debug logging around the socket close. And what that told us was the socket was closed long before Tomcat even tried to write. So it's not Tomcat writing to the socket that triggers the close. Something else does. That's really strange. Because once Tomcat's read from the socket, it doesn't touch it until it tries to write it again. So what on earth is using the socket and closing it? Bizarre. Um, and also, we can see that neither Tomcat nor the application were calling close on the socket. Um, so that brought us to debug logging version three. And something really strange seemed to be happening with the socket. So at this point, it was right, fine, we are debug logging every single method called to socket. We are debug logging every single parameter passed to every single method. We are logging every return value. We are logging every exception. Um, and that was for every single method in the socket class. And once we got that in place, we very quickly saw we got this exception message, bad file descriptor, when we first tried to write. Now, that's interesting. Now, that usually means that the socket's been closed, but nothing was calling socket close. So that was one puzzle. A second puzzle, why on earth if we're generating this exception, why isn't it in the debug box? And looking at that, what I discovered was that the point the exception was happening at was the point where we often see I.O. exceptions when the client drops the connection. So Tomcat was just swallowing it, it wasn't logging it at all. That was obviously a mistake, um, shouldn't have done that. We really do need to be debug logging every exception. So one of the first things I did was to fix that and add a piece of debug logging there. So should we ever have an issue like this again, we will have the debug logging in the right place. So that bit got fixed, but we still don't really know what's going on. Looks like the software's been closed. Have we run out of file descriptors? Quick check, no, definitely not. Um, additional logging of file descriptors told us we were, had plenty of spare, so it wasn't that. Um, maybe there are sort of parallel requests that are somehow interfering in the application. So we put much more logging in to see exactly what requests were in progress at, at the same time. And what we were able to show that we would still see the issue even when there was only one request active. So there'd be no requests, requests would be received, it would get closed instantly. And nothing else was happening on some account at all. So it wasn't any sort of interaction between multiple requests. Um, with a bit of sort of, I guess, clutching at straws really, started to think, well, there's something wrong with the file descriptor. Is the JVM mixing them up, possibly? I, it's unlikely, but you know, if you go back as far as Java 1.2, 1.3, that sort of bug did exist. Is it possible there was some sort of edge case in there that wasn't fixed properly? Seems unlikely, but debug logging version five did some very invasive reflection deep into the JRE to basically record the file descriptors. And once we got that logging, we said, actually, no, the JVM was doing exactly what it was meant to in file descriptors. So that wasn't the issue. So at this point, OK, yeah, time for S-Trace. Um, and that's kind of why, if we'd got, done this earlier, we might have got to the solution faster. But hey. So first thing S-Trace showed us was that the socket was being closed from within the JRE. But our debug logging showed us that Tomcat wasn't closing it and the app wasn't closing it. 
And I went as far as doing a code review of the JDK, and I couldn't see where the code, where the JDK might be closing the socket either. So this was really bizarre. What was triggering the close? So we tried to correlate thread dumps with when the close was occurring. That's a bit hit and miss because we had to detect the error, then trigger a thread dump and hope we'd done it fast enough. Um, we thought possibly it might have been database related, but we quite, well, I'll say quite quickly, over a couple of days and a couple of additional tests, we were able to rule that out. So eventually the approach we took was okay. Let's turn on S trace logging for absolutely everything to do with file descriptors. Doesn't matter what it is, that process on anything that goes anywhere near a file descriptor. So that again got us quite a bit of logging, but that led us to what was going on. And what that logging showed us was that there was a native library that was incorrectly managing file descriptors around a fork. What would happen is the native library would close the file descriptor once, which is absolutely fine. File descriptor gets returned to the pool. Uh, Tomcat receives a new connection. That means a file descriptor it gets the file descriptor which has been put back in the pool. Tomcat reads the connection, starts processing the response. Meanwhile, the native library closes the socket, closes the file descriptor for a second time, which closes the underlying socket, and hence breaks the connection for Tomcat, which is why when Tomcat actually tries to write, it looks like the socket is closed. Now, the problem was coming from a native library called PDF Tron, which in turn was being used in a commercial application, which then the person who reported the issue was using. So initially, when we, um, or he reported back to them, ah, yes, it's a bug in your, a library your application is using, the answer, oh, no, it can't possibly be that. No, it must be something wrong with Tomcat or your environment or blah, blah. Then we showed them all the evidence. And it was, ah, right, yeah, um, okay, yeah, no, yes, there, there's a bug there, isn't there? Um, this is how you can disable that library or the feature that uses that library. Um, so they got help from the application um, direction. We were also able to point out that actually if you switch Nginx Tomcat connection to using HTTP 1.1, you'll have a persistent connection. And because the connection isn't constantly opening and closing, you're not constantly getting a file descriptor, so there's a much lower likelihood that the native code is going to stomp on the file descriptor you're using. So that gave them another option as well. So I said I want, that brings us to the end of the um, second issue. I said I wanted to talk about a few additional techniques. Whenever I'm doing logging, particularly if you're doing something sort of in a load environment or over an extended period of time, a trick that works really well is configure uh, Tomcat's logging and Wireshark and anything else that's generating logs to use something like a five minute rolling window. And I typically actually use five one minute rolling windows. So I always have sort of five lo log files each of a length, covering a length of one minute. And then whenever the issue is detected, I take a copy of the current log files. That way you can leave the system running for hours or even days if you need to. But when the, prop, when the thing goes wrong, you have the relevant five minute log window to look at. Um, you don't need a huge amount of storage. You don't have to process really big files. Um, yeah, it's a nice little trick that can be really helpful. If I'm adding log messages, then I will often use error level logs. The reason for that is I don't need to change the default logging configuration to get them to appear in the logs. And I also don't need to enable debug logging to get them to appear, which usually also enables a bunch of other stuff I'm not interested in. So usually by the time I get to the point of writing my own de debug logs, or then I want there, that's what I want to see. The stuff that's already there just isn't enough information. So by logging them at error level, I get just what I want and I don't have to change the logging configuration. If you're exploring something that depends on network latency, um, had one of these a few years ago, I ended up having to run um, Tomcat on an instance in the cloud just to recreate the issue. These days, and probably even back then, um, in your hypervisor of choice, there is probably an option to add some latency to the network connection. Just use that, should work just as well. Issues around lost connections across multiple machines. Um, I've tried all sorts of ways to recreate this. Um, I've tried using VMs and pausing them. I've tried disabling Wi-Fi on one of the computers. I've just tried killing the browser. Um, but whatever I've done, at some point something said, ah, You've just closed, paused, stopped something that using a, that's using a network connection. Let me close that connection down gracefully for you. That's not what I want. So the only way I've been able to simulate lost connection issues is usually just by pulling out a network cable. You need two machines and just pull out a cable. Um, much more successful. I haven't really found anything else that works anywhere near as well for those sorts of issues. When it comes to multiple platforms, um, I do see issues 
uh, between OSs in terms of issues can be easier to repeat on one OS than another. VM versus bare metal, not so much. Um, seems to be the case that if it works on Windows, it'll work whether it's on bare metal or on a VM. Same for Linux, same for OS X. So that brings me to the end. So do we have any questions? And I'll just pop back to the window. I didn't see any questions thus far. OK, well, no, if anybody's got any questions, now is a really good time to ask them. Right. Maybe you can put in yet another plug for uh, perfect uh, re bug reports. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, these things are a lot easier with with good bug reports. Um, there was um, there was there were a pair of bug reports recently that were actually pretty good. Um, I think that was um, reported a couple of months ago. Initially, we couldn't reproduce it very well. Uh, you thinking of the recent CVE we published? Exactly. Yeah. Um, now it was it was it was a good bug report in that it described the issue. Um, basically, it was a, it was a um, TLS denial of service, but they weren't able to figure out what was triggering it. Um, so fortunately, because they described it really well and they captured some stack traces of where it was going wrong, we were able to make a pretty good guess at how to fix it. And as it happens, we were right. Um, we found out um, last week we had another report come in it's basically it's the same issue, but they figured out how to trigger it. Um, and that enabled us to confirm that, yes, they were the same issue, and yes, the fix did work. Um, but no, that, 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 was, that, that was good in that it told us everything apart from how to recreate it. And to um, really fix an issue, you need to be able to recreate it. If you can't, then you're guessing. If we go back a really long time, um, there was an issue, there was a concurrency issue in the default servlet that we couldn't recreate. And somebody was arguing for months and months to apply a fix. And we refused because we couldn't see how the fix was going, actually going to address the particular issue. It did because it just changed the timing. But we were far from convinced it was, a, it was fixing the root cause. And it took about, Oh, two years, I think, until somebody else came along and said, ah, I found this really subtle timing issue. And they were able to actually describe how the issue occurred. And then we said, yep, yeah, that's they're the same thing. Right. Now we know what the problem is. We can see the root cause. Now we can fix it. Um, and from a Tomcat point of view, I think we would always prefer to fix the root cause than put a sticking plaster over a symptom. Thanks for that. Uh, Eduardo de Luna asks, uh, with the PDF Tron issue, um, how how'd the conversation go to allow, uh, I guess, our user <clears throat> to convince the vendor that the problem was really on their end? Were you involved in that, or did we just uh, kind of turn over all the evidence to? The I, I gathered the evidence and I wrote up a a text file that basically walked through the relevant part of the S trace log where you could see the file descriptor being closed twice. And at that point, I think it was game over. Um, you, can't, you, know, you can't argue against that. Um, so I think once, once they've been presented with that, um, they kind of put their hand up to it. Um, so I think, there was, I think there was pushback once um, until we sort of gave, gave them that detailed walkthrough. And then it was, um, yeah, fine, OK. Um, we accept there's a problem there. And I. I have a, I do have some sympathy for them. You know, Tomcat gets a fair number of bug reports that are absolutely nothing to do with Tomcat. Um, so you do want to see at least some sort of evidence of what's going wrong, why it's going wrong, um, before you start making changes. And PDF Tron is a closed source product, right? So we couldn't look at their code. We could just look at the S traces coming out. C correct, and I didn't even know what app what it was being used in another commercial web application. I didn't even know what that web application was. Um, 
So this, the whole thing was completely right. All I had to go on was, was the, the logs. And I could make a few guesses looking at some of the URLs, um, but I was trying not to look at the, that data too hard because there was a lot of, there was some various bits of data in there. So I'm trying to just focus on the bits I needed to see. All right, any other questions? Uh, I think somebody commented that um, oh yeah, you spend so much time on a bug and it ends up being not your responsibility. Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> but it's I'd rather that than have something left open that we think might be a bug in Tomcat and not know. Um, clo closing out a bug is still a win, um, even if it's not ultimately our fault. And there's a there's a third one that I would have talked about if I had more time that ultimately turns out to be um, a bug in the Linux network layer. Um, but that went through Tomcat and a web application and the Spring framework before we figured out where that one was. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that definitely fell into complex. Um, it was also one that were, there were multiple issues. I think Tomcat fixed two or three things. Spring fixed about the same as well. Um, so it, there, there was lots going on uh, all around edge cases on um, asynchronous I.O. and error handling, which is always fun. Uh, why did you say thread dumps is a hit or miss? Uh, the problem was that what we were trying to do was we suspected that something was closing the socket. Um, so the idea was as soon as the socket closed, as soon as the so as soon as we spotted the error, trigger a thread dump, and hopefully we'd see something in the thread dump that was messing about with the socket that we weren't expecting. The problem was it's, it's partly the delay between um, the socket being closed, the error occurring, and us being able to get the thread dump. Um, and partly that even if we got that, I probably wouldn't have looked at the native code anyway. So the native code was nothing to do with network I/O or anything. It was you know off generating PDFs. So I don't think we would have joined the dots even if we had been able to get that to work properly. We might have done if we'd got a lot of data and it had worked very well, but I think the inherent delays in the process added enough noise that it made it really difficult. And I say, we ended up thinking it might be something database related, but that was just a case that there was a lot of database activity going on. So it wasn't unusual to see database stuff in the thread dump. Um, and it was databases were using network sockets. So we thought there might be some connection there. Um, so that's why that didn't work as well as it could have done. It was really that delay between the, prob the thing actually happening and then us being able to trigger the thread dump to try and work out what thread was doing it. Okay, how am I doing for time? Uh, oh, I'm all right. Okay. Uh, if anybody does have, uh, do you have any advice on dealing with bugs on libraries where the problem has been addressed, but updating the version is not an option? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um, depends what the bug is. Um, if you know what the problem is, then um, you, know, you, you might be, you can at least explore what your options for working around it are. Um, yeah, if you can change your own application code, then that might give, give you an option. Um, it might be something as simple as, well, okay, if we we know the problem is triggered by using compression, so let's turn off compression. Yeah, we'll, we'll take the performance hit. It, it depends very much on the bug. I mean, you have to look at the, the bug in question to see um, what your options might be, but certainly think as broadly as you can. You know, does um, you know, just changing from HTTP 2 back to HTTP 1.1 help? Um, does changing a connector help? Um, you know, does, does changing the JVM help? So, you know, it, dep it depends a lot on what the bug is um, and how much you know, how much flexibility you've got for what you can change and what you can't. I think each of those is probably a case-by-case -case basis. But as always, if you've got a question, so, you know, how do I avoid this just in configuration, you know, come over to the users list. Provide us with the details, and um, yeah, we'll do our best to help you out. And the answer might be, sorry, you're going to have to update the library, but sometimes we might be able to help you find a way around it. Okay. Any more right. questions? 
I think it's time for the next session to start. So, Mark, thank you very much for your uh, time today. Let's you're see. you're very welcome. Um, if there are any more questions, then please feel free to head over to the Tomcat users list and ask them there. Myself and the other Tomcat committers, I'm sure, will be happy to do our best to help you. And enjoy the rest of the sessions. Hopefully see you all in the birds of a feather later. <laughs>